Spain herself records in her history more revolutions when the press was gagged. What colonies have become independent while they have had a free press and enjoyed liberty? Is it preferable to govern blindly or to govern with ample knowledge? Someone will answer that in colonies, we answer that the prestige of the nation is preferable to that of a few individuals. A nation acquires respect, not by abetting and concealing abuses, but by rebuking and punishing them. Moreover, to this prestige is applicable what Napoleon said about great men and their valets. We, who endure and know all the false pretensions and petty persecutions of those shem gods, do not need a free press in order to recognize them. They have long ago lost their press. The free press is needed by the government, the government which still dreams of the prestige which it builds upon mind ground. We say the same about the Filipino representatives. What risks does the government see in them? One of three things. Either that they will prove unruly, become political trimmers, or act properly. Supposing that we should... This is the most... Moreover, it is said that the Filipinos are indolent and peaceful. Then what need the government fear? Hasn't it any influence in the elections? Frankly, if they become political trimmers, as is to be expected, and as they probably will be so much the better for the government and so much the worse for their constituents, they would be a few more favorable votes, and the government could laugh openly at the separatists, if any there be. If they become what they should be, worthy, honest, and faithful to their trust, they will undoubtedly annoy an ignorant or incapable minister with their questions, but they will help him to govern. Now then, if the real objection to the Filipino delegates is that they smell like Igorots, which so disturbed in open senate the doughty general Salamanca, then Don Sinibaldo de Mas, and if this were all, the Filipinos, who there in their own country are accustomed to bathy every day, when they become representatives may give up such a dirty custom. At least during the le it is useless to answer certain objections of some fine writers regarding the rather brown skins and faces with somewhat wide nostrils. Questions of taste are peculiar to each race. China, for example, which has 400 million inhabitants and a very ancient civilization, considers all Europeans ugly and calls them fan quay or red devils. Its taste has a hundred million more adherents than the European. Moreover, if this is the question, we would have to admit the inferiority of the Latins, especially the Spaniards, to the Saxons, who are much whiter. And so long as it is not asserted that the Spanish Parliament is an assemblage of Adonises, Antonazes, pretty boys, and other like paragons, so long as the purpose of resort law has no skin, nor reason nostrils, so we see no serious reason why the Philippines may not have representatives. By their institution many malcontents would be silenced, and instead of blaming its troubles upon the government, as now happens, the country would bear them better, for it could at least complain, and with we are not sure that we serve the true interests of our country by asking for representatives. We know that the lack of enlightenment, the indolence, the egotism of our fellow countrymen, and the boldness, the cunning, and the powerful methods of those who wish their obscurant, but we wish to be loyal to the government, and we are pointing out to it the road that appears best to us so that its efforts may not come to grief, so that discontent may disappear. If after so just, as well as necessary, a measure has been introduced, the Filipino people are so stupid and weak that they are treacherous to their own interests. Every country gets the fate it deserves, and the government can say that it has done its duty. These are the two fundamental reforms, which properly interpreted and applied, will dissipate all clouds, assure affection towards Spain, and make all succeeding reforms. These are the reforms sine quebus non. It is puerile to fear that independence may come through them. The free press will keep the government in touch with public opinion, and the representatives, if they are as they ought to be, the best from among the sons of the Philippines, will 
with no cause for discontent, how then attempt to stir up the masses of the people? Likewise inadmissible is the objection offered by some regarding the imperfect culture of the majority of the Aside from the fact that it is not so imperfect as is averred, there is no plausible reason why the ignorant and the defective, whether through their own or another's fault, should be denied representation. They are the very ones who most need it. No one ceases to be. To reason otherwise is to reason stupidly. When the laws and the acts of officials are kept under surveillance, the word justice may cease to be a colonial jest. The thing that makes the English most respected in their possessions is their strict and speedy justice, so that the inhabitants repose entire confidence in the judges. Justice is the foremost virtue of the civilizing races. It subdues the barbarous nations, while injustice arouses the weakest. Offices and trusts should be awarded by competition, publishing the work and the judgment thereon, so that there may be stimulus and that discontent may not be bred. Then, if the native does not shake off his indolence, he cannot complain when he sees all the offices filled by Castellus. We presume that it will not be the Spaniard who fears to enter into this contest, for thus will he be able to prove his superiority by the superiority of intelligence. Although this is not the custom in the sovereign country, it should be practiced in the colonies, for the reason that genuine prestige should be sought by means of moral qualities, because the colonizers ought to be, the offices and trusts so earned will do away with arbitrary dismissal and develop employees and officials capable and cognizant of their duties. The offices held by natives, instead of endangering the Spanish domination, will merely serve to assure it for what interest would they have in converting the sure and stable into the uncertain and problem. Let the various Filipinos still holding office speak in this matter. They are the most unshaken conservatives. We could add other minor reforms touching commerce, agriculture, security of the individual and of property, education, and so on. But these are... For the present we are satisfied with the outlines, and no one can say that we asked too much. There will not be lacking critics to accuse us of utopianism, but what is utopia? Utopia was a country imagined by Thomas More, wherein existed universal suffrage. When the book was published, these things were looked upon as dreams, impossibilities, that is, utopianism. Yet civilization has left the country of utopia far behind. The human will and conscience have worked greater miracles, have abolished slavery and the death penalty for adultery things impossible. The question has also been raised in the English Parliament of giving representation to the Crown Colonies, for the others already enjoy some autonomy. The press there also is free. Only Spain, which in the 16th century was the model nation in civilization, lags far behind. Cuba and Puerto Rico, whose inhabitants do not number a third of those of the Philippines, and who have not made such sacrifices for Spain, have numerous representatives. The Philippines, in the early days, had theirs, who conferred with the king and the pope on the needs of the country. They had them in Spain's critical moments, when she groaned under the Napoleonic yoke, and they did not take advantage of the sovereign country's misfortune like other colonies, but tightened more firmly. What crime have the Islands committed that they are deprived of their rights? To recapitulate, the Philippines will remain Spanish if they enter upon the life of law, and civilization. Otherwise, if an attempt is made to see in the Islands a load to be exploited, a resource to satisfy ambitions, thus to relieve the sovereign country of taxes, killing the goose that colonies established to subserve the policy and the commerce of the sovereign country, all eventually become independent, said Bachelet, and before Bachelet all the Phoenician, close indeed are the bonds that unite us to Spain. Two peoples do not live for three centuries in continual contact, sharing the same lot, shedding their blood on the same fields, holding the same beliefs, worshipping the same God. Mutual sacrifices and benefits have engendered affection. Machiavelli, the great reader of the human heart, said, 
la natura degli humani, e cose obligarsi per li benefici ci essa fanno come per quelli ci essa race. All this, and more, is true, but it is pure sentimentality, and in the arena of politics stern necessity and interests prevail. Howsoever much the Filipinos owe Spain, they cannot be required to forego their redemption, to have their liberal and enlightened sons wander about in exile from their native land. Spain cannot claim, not even in the name of God himself, that six millions of people should be brutalized, exploited and oppressed, denied light and the rights inherent. There is no claim of gratitude that can excuse. There is not enough powder in the world to justify the offenses against the liberty of the individual, against the sanctity of the home. Again, there is no divinity that can proclaim the sacrifice of our dearest affections, the sacrifice of the family, the sacrileges and wrongs that are committed by persons who have the name of God on their lip. No one can require an impossibility of the Filipino people, the noble Spanish people, so jealous of its rights and liberties, cannot bid the Filipinos renounce theirs. A people that prides itself on the glories of its past cannot ask another, trained by it, to accept objection and dishonor its own name, we who today are struggling by the legal, if what we desire is not realized. In contemplating such an unfortunate eventuality, we must not turn away in horror, and so instead of closing our eyes we will face what the future may bring. For this purpose, after throwing the handful of dust due to Cerberus, let us frankly descend into the abyss and sound its terrible mysteries. If history does not record in its annals any lasting domination exercised by one people over another, of different race, of diverse usages and customs, of opposite and divert, one of the two had to yield and succumb. Either the foreigner was driven out, as happened in the case of the Carthaginians, the Moors and the French in Spain, or else these autochthons had to give way and perish, as was the case with the inhabitants. One of the longest dominations was that of the Moors in Spain, which lasted seven centuries. But, even though the conquerors lived in the country conquered, even though the peninsula was broken up into small states, which gradually emerged like little islands in the midst of the great Saracen the existence of a foreign body within another endowed with strength and activity is contrary to all natural and ethical laws. Science teaches us that it is either assimilated, destroys the organism, is eliminated, or becomes insisted. Insistment of a conquering people is impossible, for it signifies complete isolation, absolute inertia, debility in the conquering element. Insistment thus means the tomb of the foreign invader. Now, applying these considerations to the Philippines, we must conclude, as a deduction from all we have said, that if their population be not assimilated to the Spanish nation, to this law of destiny can be opposed neither Spanish patriotism, nor the love of all the Filipinos for Spain, nor the doubtful future of dismemberment and intestine strife in the island. Necessity is the most powerful divinity the world knows and necessity is the resultant of physical forces set in operation by ethical forces. We have said and statistics prove that it is impossible to exterminate the Filipino people. And even were it possible, what interest would Spain have in the destruction of the inhabitants of a country she cannot populate or cultivate, whose climate is to a certain extent disastrous to her? Well, moreover, in order to destroy the six million Malays, even supposing them to be in their infancy, and that they have never learned to fight and defend themselves, Spain would have to sacrifice. This we commend to the notice of the partisans of colonial exploitation. But nothing of this kind can happen. The menace is that when the education and liberty necessary to human existence are denied by Spain to the Filipinos, then they will seek enlightenment abroad, behind the mother country's back. Hatred and resentment on one side, mistrust and anger on the other, will finally result in a violent and terrible collision, especially when there exist elements interested in how It is to be expected that the government will triumph and be generally, as is the custom, severe in punishment, either to teach a stern lesson in order to vaunt its strength or even to revenge. 
An unavoidable concomitant of those catastrophes is the accumulation of acts of injustice committed against the innocent and peaceful inhabitants. Private reprisals, denunciations, despicable accusations, resentments, covetousness, the opportune moment for calumny, the haste and hurried procedure of the courts. The result is that a chasm of blood is then opened between the two peoples, that the wounded and the afflicted, instead of becoming fewer, are increased, for to the families and friends of the note, that if severe measures are dangerous in a nation made up of a homogeneous population, the peril is increased a hundredfold when the government is formed of a race different from the government. In the former, an injustice may still be ascribed to one man alone, to a governor actuated by personal malice, and with the death of the tyrant the victim is reconciled to the government of his. But in a country dominated by a foreign race, even the justest act of severity is construed as injustice and oppression, because it is ordered by a foreigner who is unsympathetic Hence the great prudence and fine tact that should be exercised by colonizing countries, and the fact that government regards the colonies in general, and our colonial office in particular, such as the descent down which the peoples are precipitated, in proportion as they are bathed in blood and drenched in tears and gall. The colony, if it has any vitality, learns how to struggle and perfect itself in fighting, while the mother she is like the rich voluptuary accustomed to be waited upon by a crowd of servants toiling and planting for him, and who on the day his slaves refuse him obedience, as he does not live by his reprisals, wrongs and suspicions on one part, and on the other the sentiment of patriotism and liberty, which is aroused in these incessant conflicts, insurrections and uprising, the struggle will be brief, for it will amount to a slavery much more cruel than death for the people and to a dishonorable loss of prestige for the dominator. One of the peoples must succumb. Spain, from the number of her inhabitants, from the condition of her army and navy, from the distance she is situated from the Islands, from her scanty knowledge of them, and from struggle, all this at the cost of bludged and crime, after mortal conflicts, murders, conflagrations, military executions, famine, and misery. The Spaniard is gallant and patriotic, and sacrifices everything, in favorable moments, for his country's good. He has the intrepidity of his bull. The Filipino loves his country no less, and although he is quieter, more peaceful, and with difficulty stirred up, when he is once aroused he does not hesitate, and for him the struggle means he has all the meekness and all the tenacity and ferocity of his carabao. Climate affects bipes in the same way that it does quadrupeds. The terrible lessons and the hard teachings that these conflicts will have afforded the Filipinos will operate to improve and strengthen their ethical nature. The Spain of the 15th century was not the Spain of the 8th. With their bitter experience, instead of intestine conflicts of some islands against others, as is generally feared, they will extend mutual support, like shipwrecked persons when they reach, nor may it be said that we shall partake of the fate of the small American republics. They achieved their independence easily, and their inhabitants are animated by a different spirit from what the Filipinos are. Besides, the danger of falling again into other hands, English or German, for example, will force the Filipinos to be sensible and prudent. Absence of any great preponderance of one race over the others will free their imagination from all mad ambitions of domination, and as the tendency of countries that have been tyrannized over. If the Philippines secure their independence after heroic and stubborn conflicts, they can rest assured that neither England, nor Germany, nor France, and still less Holland, within a few years Africa will completely absorb the attention of the Europeans, and there is no sensible nation which, in order to secure a group of poor and hostile islands, will neglect the England has enough colonies in the Orient and is not going to risk losing her balance. She is not going to sacrifice her Indian empire for the poor Philippine islands if she had entertained such an intention she would not have restored Manila in 1763, but would have kept some point. Moreover, what need has John Bull the traitor to exhaust himself for the Philippines, when he is already lord of the Orient, 
when he has there Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. Furthermore, there exist in the United Kingdom tendencies and opinions to the effect that she already has too many colonies, that they are harmful, that they greatly weaken the sovereign country. For the same reasons Germany will not care to run any risk, and because a scattering of her forces and a war in distant countries will endanger her existence on the continent. Thus we see her attitude, as much in the Pacific as in Africa, is confined to conquering easy territory that belongs to nobody. Germany avoids any foreign complications. France has enough to do and sees more of a future in Tonkin and China. Besides the fact that the French spirit does not shine in zeal for colonization, France loves glory, but the glory and laurels that grow on the battlefields of Europe. The echo from battlefields in the Far East hardly satisfies her craving for renown, for it reaches her quite faintly. She has also other obligations, both internally and on the continent. Holland is sensible, and will be content to keep the Molokas and Java. Sumatra offers her a greater future than the Philippines, whose seas and coasts have a sinister omen for Dutch expeditions. Holland proceeds with great caution in Sumatra and Borneo, from fear of losing everything. Chena will consider herself fortunate if she succeeds in keeping herself intact and is not dismembered or partitioned among the European powers that are colonizing the continent of Asia. The same is true of Japan. On the north she has Russia, who envies and watches her. On the south England, with whom she is in accord even to her official language. She is, moreover, under such diplomatic pressure from Europe that she cannot think of outside affairs until she is freed from it, which will not be an easy matter. True it is that she has an excess of population, but Korea attracts her more than the Philippines and is also easier to seize. Perhaps the great American Republic, whose interests lie in the Pacific and who has no hand in the spoliation of Africa, may some day dream of foreign possession. This is not impossible, for the example is contagious covetousness and ambition are among the strongest vices, and Harrison manifested something of this sort in the Semon question. But the Panama Canal is not open nor the territory of the states congested with inhabitants, and in case she should openly attempt it the European powers would not allow her to proceed, for they know very North America would be quite a troublesome rival if she should once get into the business. Furthermore, this is contrary to her traditions. Very likely the Philippines will defend with inexpressible valor the liberty secured at the price of so much blood and sacrifice. With the new men that will spring from their soil and with the recollection of their past, they will perhaps strive to enter freely upon the wide road of progress, and all will labor together to strengthen their... Then the mines will be made to give up their gold for relieving distress, iron for weapons, copper, lead, and coal. Perhaps the country will revive the maritime and mercantile life for which the Islanders are fitted by their nature, ability, and instincts, and once more free, like the bird. These and many other things may come to pass within something like a hundred years. But the most logical prognostication, the prophecy based on the best probabilities, may err through remote and insignificant causes. An octopus that seized Mark Antony's ship altered the face of the world. A cross on cavalry and a just man nailed, there unchanged the ethics of half the human race, and yet a sunken road at the Battle of Waterloo buried all the glories of two brilliant decades, the whole Napoleonic world, and freed Europe. Upon what chance accidents will the destiny of the Philippines depend? Nevertheless, it is not well to trust it to accident for there is sometimes an imperceptible and, fortunately, peoples as well as governments are subject to it. Therefore, we repeat, and we will ever repeat, while there is time, that it is better to keep pace with the desires of a people than to give way before them. The former begets sympathy and, since it is necessary to grant six million Filipinos their rights, so that they may be in fact Spaniards, let the government grant these rights freely and spontaneously without damaging reservation. We shall never tire of repeating this while a ray of hope is left to us, 
for we prefer this unpleasant task to the need of some day saying to the mother countries, Spain, we have spent our youth. What dost thou wish us to tell our wretched country when it asks about the result of our efforts? We say to it that, since for it we have lost everything, the news came as a painful surprise, but, believing it already closed, I kept silent over an incident which I considered irremediable. Now I notice indications of the disturbances continuing, and if any still, in good or bad faith, are availing themselves of my name, to stop this abuse and undeceive from the very beginning, when I first had notice of what was being planned, I opposed it, and demonstrated its absolute impossibility. This is the fact, and witnesses to my words are now living. I was convinced that the scheme was utterly absurd, and what was worse would bring great suffering. I did even more. When later, against my advice, the movement materialized, of my own accord I offered not alone my good offices, but my very life, and even my name, to be used in this equally my countrymen, I have given proofs that I am one most anxious for liberties for our country, and I am still desirous of them. But I place as a prior condition the education of the people, that by means of instruction and industry our country may have an individuality of its own and make itself worthy of these liberties. I have recommended in my writings the study of civic virtues, without which there is no redemption. I have written likewise, and repeat my words, that reforms to be beneficial must come from above, that those which come from below are irregularly gained and uncertain. Holding these ideas, I cannot do less than condemn. And I do condemn this uprising as absurd savage and plotted behind my back, which dishonors us, Philip. I abhor its criminal methods and disclaim all part in it, pitying from the bottom of my heart the unwary who have been deceived. Return, then, to your homes, and may God pardon those who have worked in bad faith. Jos Risel, Fort Sanchigo, December 15, 1896. The Spanish judge advocate general commented upon the address. The preceding address to his countrymen which Dr. Reisel proposes to direct to them, is not in substance the patriotic protest against separatist manifestations and tendencies which ought to come from those who claim to be loyal sons of Spain. According to his declarations, Don Jos Reisel limits himself to condemning the present insurrectionary movement as premature and because he considers now its triumph impossible, but leaves it to be in For Reisel the question is of opportuneness, not of principles nor of aims, his manifesto might be summarized in these words. Because of my proofs of the rebellion's certainty to fail, lay down your arms, my countrymen. Later I shall lead you to the promised land. So far from being conducive to peace, it could advance in the future the spirit of rebellion. For this reason the publication of the proposed address seems impolitic, and I would recommend to your excellency to forbid its being made public, but to order that all these papers be forwarded to the the only council permitted him, a young lieutenant selected from the junior Spanish army officers, risked the displeasure of his superiors in the few words he did say, but his argument, the court scene, where Risel sat for hours with his elbows corded back of him while the crowd, unrebuked by the court, clamored for his death, recalls the stories of the he was compelled to testify himself, was not permitted to hear the testimony given for the prosecution. No witness dared favor him, much less appear in his behalf, and his own additions to my defense Don Jos Risley Alonso respectfully requests the court-martial to consider well the following circumstances. First, read the rebellion. From July 6, 1892, I had absolutely no connection with politics until July 1st of this year when, advised by Don Pio Valenzuela that an uprising was... Don Pio Valenzuela left me convinced apparently, so much so that instead of later taking part in rebellion, he presented himself to the authorities for pardon. Secondly, a proof that I maintained no political relation with any one, 
and of the falsity of the statement that i was in the habit of sending letters by my family is the fact that it was necessary if what has been charged were true what occasion was there for don pio to attract the attention of any one and incur large expenses besides the mere fact of sir